Uh, we're continuing our study, actually the last lesson, dealing with preparation for the end times. Very relevant study. And um, I want to mention that if some of our friends who are tuning in via Facebook, if you have questions about the lesson today, they usually pop it up there on the screen and, and I'll read your question, do the best I can to answer your question. Gives us a little more of an interactive feel. Lesson number 13 is talking today about the return of the Lord. The return of the Lord Jesus. And we have a memory verse. Memory verse is Matthew 24, 27. And how many of you know that by heart? You should. For as the lightning, you want to say it with me? For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Why is that an important verse for us? Do a lot of Christians think the coming of the Lord is going to be a secret? That all of a sudden people will start disappearing? Cars will crash and planes will go down because the driver was raptured away and life goes on here on earth for another um, seven years and people will say, what happened? They'll say, well, Jesus came. It was secret. But does Jesus say his coming is a secret? Or does he say it is the most visible, physical, climatic thing in history? Uh, if you name one of your senses, name, what are the, you know, you get your five senses. Hearing. Name one. Hearing. Will we hear him come? So it'll be like a trumpet. It'll be like a shout. Name another sense. Eyes. Eyes. Every eye will see him when he comes. Name another sense. Couldn't hear you. Taste. You will taste and see that the Lord is good. <laughs> what touch? Will the earth be shaking? Will you feel it? When the Lord comes, you'll probably smell it too because there'll be burning cities. <laughs> Which could be in your taste. I'm still working on that one. <laughs> so the reason I'm telling you is that every one of your senses is going to be letting you know the Lord came. It's not going to be a secret. And so it says the Lord is coming with a shout. The earth's going to shake. It's going to be the brightest thing. It, it's a climatic event. There'll be a resurrection that you'll experience around you. And so you know, this lesson doesn't focus a lot on that principle that the return of the Lord is not a secret. And I personally think that's something you really need to make clear. When I first became a Christian and I worshiped with a lot of my uh, evangelical charismatic friends, they all talked about how the Lord was going to come and people were going to disappear. And I said, you know, I'm just not seeing that in the Bible. I see that when the Lord comes, that it's earth shaking. Then it says, like a roar. It says, the cities are broken down by his presence. It's going to be like lightning shining from the east to the west. Any of you, have you ever been in a, um, a lightning storm? Now, we don't have them in California like they have in the plains. But I remember in Texas, there's no mountains to block your visibility there. There would be lightning from sky to sky. And you could close your eyes and put your pillow over your head and you'd still see the flash. I, it was, how many of you know what I'm talking about? It was so bright, and it would scare me because you'd hear a pop right outside your window. We used to have them in Florida, very loud. And I was in a bunk bed at a summer camp, and the lightning was so close that everybody touching the bed got shocked. Uh, obviously, it didn't kill me, but you could feel it. It was electricity in the air. Well, it says that this is like lightning from one side of the sky to the other. There's nothing secret about when Jesus comes. So there are hundreds of prophecies in the Bible that talk about the coming of the Lord. And it's kind of sad. You know, you can go to some churches and some denominations. You can go for 50 years and never hear a sermon on the second coming. And uh, they almost think it's too sensational. But the Bible talks about it, and we ought to talk about it because... What if Jesus didn't come? What kind of world would this be? Isn't that the, the blessed hope? That's the most climatic event. This world is not going to go on forever the way you see it. Now, in the Bible, you have a lot of Old Testament prophecies that talk about the second coming of Jesus. They do not always refer to it as the second coming. It's often called the day of the Lord. And in many ways and times and cases, it's a frightening event. It seems a little ominous. And we're going to look at some of those verses. By the way, the phrase, the day of the Lord, and there's some different derivatives of that, but just exactly the day of the Lord is found 32 times in the Bible. 
many of those in the Old Testament. Let me give you a few examples. Joel chapter 2, verse 31. Then the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of that great and awesome day of the Lord. The great, awesome day of the Lord. What's that talking about? Second coming of Jesus. It's the end of days. Isaiah 13, 6 and 7. Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore all hands will be limp and every man's heart will melt. Now some are thinking, Pastor Doug, these Old Testament things about the second coming seem kind of sad. But it's that way in the New Testament with some of them too. It says, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Why does it make it sound ominous and frightening and not always positive? Will more people be saved or lost? It's sad, but most people, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Most people reject Jesus, which is so sad because he paid for everybody's sins. And so it's, it's a warning. God is warning people. You need to repent of your sins. This day is going to be a frightening thing. You know, Amos says, prepare to meet the Lord. You can go to the New Testament, and you can read in Jude verse 14. There's only one chapter, so it's just verse 14. Now, I'm reading you Old Testament prophecies about the second coming, but this is an Old Testament prophecy about the second coming found in the New Testament. Are you confused? Because he's quoting Enoch, who is an Old Testament character. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these, saying also, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all the ungodly and convict all the wicked of their ungodly deeds they've committed. I'm going on. Zechariah 14.9. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. And in that day, it shall be the Lord is one and his name is one. There'll be a, a day when God is king over all the earth. Right now, that kingdom is contested by the devil. Things are not going to stay this way forever. You know, the first question the disciples ask after Jesus rises from the dead, before he ascends to heaven, when you read Acts chapter 1, you know what they were asking him? Lord, will you at this time establish the kingdom? So, when Jesus began preaching and he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and John the Baptist began preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what kind of kingdom was he talking about? You know, Jesus said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation for the kingdom of God is within you. Part of the kingdom of God begins when you accept Jesus and he reigns in your heart as your king. That's the internal kingdom of God. Is that where it stops? A lot of churches stop there. But what good is it if it always stays in internal internal kingdom if at some point he is not a literal king of the world. So the Bible is going to say there's a time when God is going to be the king uh, all, over all the earth. That was Zechariah 14. Job 19. Oldest book in the Bible is really Job. Job 19.25 For I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand at last on the earth and after my skin is destroyed this I know that in my flesh, resurrected flesh, I will see God, who I will see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, and oh, how my heart yearns within me. You can read Chronicles 16.33. You realize we're not reading them all. There's 33 that say the day of the Lord. I'm just giving you an overview. Chronicles 16.33. Then the trees of the wood shall rejoice before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. So when it talks about the day of the Lord, it often talks about a day of judgment, it's a day of rescue, God's people being rescued from oppression. It's a day of restoration. You see, when you read in Genesis, and God made the world, what was the condition of things before sin? Perfect. God says, good, 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 and then finally says, very good. What happened to God's perfect plan? Got messed up by the snake, the devil. So God said, okay, you win, I lose. You can have the world. Is that what he did? Or did God say, no, I'm going to redeem the world. I'm going to cleanse the world. I'm going to make it new. And I am going to do what I set out to do in the beginning. The first three chapters of the Bible tell how man lost paradise. Chapter three is where the devil appears. The last three chapters of the Bible talk about the serpent being destroyed and paradise restored. And God will be the king over all the earth. That's the new covenant. It says, they will all know me from the least unto the greatest. Before you call, I will answer. 
Uh, so God is going to complete his plan. And, you know, some people think, well, you know, when you get to heaven, we're going to have our glorified bodies and we'll be ghosts, you know, we'll just float on clouds and we'll play harps. I say, was that God's original plan for Adam and Eve? Or did Adam and Eve, were they horticulturists? They planted and they were to tend the garden. And the Bible says we will plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. Speaking of heaven, we will build houses and inhabit them. And it said it's going to be a real world just like he had always planned for Adam and Eve. Except it's going to be an upgrade. It'll be better than the original. Once or twice I've gone to National to pick up my rental car. And I usually get you know, the economy or mid-sized car. And, and they say, oh, you know, there's a rush. All the cars are gone. I say, oh, no. And they say, well, don't worry, though. Because it's our fault and things got messed up, we're going to give you an upgrade. And so God is going to give us an upgraded world. How is he upgrading? He's moving the capital of his universe to our planet. God himself will be with us. Isn't that wonderful? So the second coming of Jesus is talking about the restoration of all things. Now for the wicked, it says then the rich men and the chief men and the captains and every wise man and every noble man, they go and they run and they hide from the presence of the Lamb and they call for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them. So for them it's a frightening thing. But how will the righteous respond? It said, they will look up and they'll say, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. So there's two responses you're going to see in the Bible to the second coming. The second coming is going to look negative and ominous and fearful for the lost. And it should be. And it's going to be the brightest day for the saved. But it'll even be awesome for them. And I've often said, um, you got a couple of kinds of bugs that respond differently. If you, if you ever go and uh, turn over a rock out in the field, you've got these bugs that live in the dark under the rock, and they crawl away as fast as they can from the light. When I lived in New York City, sometimes we'd struggle with cockroaches. And you'd walk in a room, and you'd flip on the light, and there they were. But when they saw the light, they went scurrying into the dark places. But if you're in a dark place, and you turn on a light out in the woods, every moth within a mile is going to come. To the light. Isn't that right? So you got some bugs that run from the light, and you got some that fly to the light. So the question is, what will you be? What kind of bug will you be <laughs> when Jesus comes? Did that just lift your self-esteem? <laughs> All right. Spin out some positive ones. First Chronicles 16:33. Then the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. So it talks about rejoicing too in the Old Testament. Now, somebody here is going to uh, read for me um, Philippians here in just a moment. You'll have that one? Okay. I'm going to first read, and they're going to talk about the book of life. Who will be ready when Jesus comes? Exodus 32, 32 and 33. Moses is interceding. This ties in with our sermon later today. And he said, yet now, this is after they've done the golden calf. They sinned against the Lord. God is going to take their name out of the book of life. And Moses is pleading for the people. He says, yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray you, blot me out of your book, which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. But well, one thing very important here, uh, Moses sort of is a type of Christ. He's the great mediator. And, and he's saying, look, I'm willing to sacrifice my name in the book of life to put their name in the book of life. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? He said, I'll trade places. But God is saying, look, Moses, whoever has sinned against me, each man's going to suffer according to his own works. The other thing we learned from this verse is there's a record. There's a book. Now, do you think that the Lord has books in heaven, like our books, you know, they, that God cuts down trees and he mills them up and he makes pulp and he gets ink and he has a printing press and he prints books up there? When we were just in uh, Jerusalem, Karen and I went to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. And um, they used to write them on, uh, some were on parchment, most were on vellum. It was like this very fine leather material that held up very well in the desert for 2,000 years. Is it going to be scrolls of leather in heaven? Or when God tells us a book, having books, the way that books are compiled, it's changed. What kind of book is it? Is God going to have a thumb drive? A USB? 
is it going to be a DVD? You know, for years I thought it was a cassette tape. And before that, an 8-track. <laughs> if anyone remembers that. So the technology, we, but we don't know exactly what the book looks like. But God has a record. I think when we get to heaven and angels open the books and show us, uh, during the millennium, will we be able to look at those books? Yeah, you know, God said that the library will be open. Every secret thing is going to be manifest. Now, our sins are blotted out, but nothing else is. So um, uh, there's a book. There's a record. Now, the most important book is which book? Book of, book of Life. There's also evidently books of records. Doesn't the Lord say in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said, uh, every idle word that men speak, they will give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. And that makes me tremble, doesn't it you? If it wasn't for God's mercy and he has a big eraser, I'd be worried. Every idle word. How many words do you speak in a day? Every idle, frivolous thing that we say. And so uh, he's got a record. You know what's amazing right now? I just read this week, uh, China uh, six months ago had the world's most powerful computer. Now the United States once again has reclaimed the title for the most powerful computer. It's an IBM computer. And it's mind-boggling the amount of, you know, billions of uh, processes that it can make in a fraction of a second. And all the information it can store. You know, now Google and Amazon, they're all storing all this information in the cloud. Well, God invented the cloud a long time ago. Isn't that right? He's had it all stored for a long time. So he, there's the records, but the book of life is a book where we come to the Lord, we say we believe in the Lord, we believe His sacrifice on our behalf, He puts our name in His book. But the Bible tells us that some names can be removed. Now that, that is troubling. Doesn't it say that uh, if we have faith in Revelation, I think it's chapter 2 or 3, seven churches, he said, uh, I will not take his name out of my book. And here again, you're reading where Moses and the Lord are talking, talks about names being taken out of the book. So we must have our name in the book of life when Jesus comes. All right, you're going to read for us, please, Philippians 4, verse 3. And I urge you also, true companions, help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. All right, so Paul is even saying that right there in the beginning that there are names that are in the book of life. And uh, he doesn't say their names will be. He says their names are written in the book of life. So that means, can you have your name in the book of life now? Wouldn't that be exciting to think about? You ever heard that song, Is My Name Written There? Um, you can read in Daniel 12. At that time, Michael will stand up. Prophecy about the end. The great prince, prince who stands over, watch over the sons of your people, and there will be a time of trouble such as there never has been since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people will be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. So who, who's delivered in the last days? Those whose names are in the book. It talks about a great time of trouble. Now, does Jesus also talk about a time of trouble such as there never has been? He that endures to the end will be saved. And so uh, you need to know your name is written in the book because those are the ones who are delivered. Everyone else is going to be um, really struggling during that time. Another verse, Book of Life, Revelation 3, 5. He who overcomes, this is the one I was thinking about. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments and I will not blot his name from the Book of Life. Now what does that say? Can a name be blotted from the book of life? Yeah. Are there some churches that teach once you're saved you can't be lost? But doesn't the Bible make it pretty clear that some people can outwardly say, I'm saved, they see, they accept Jesus, and they turn away. And so he said, those who overcome, I will not blot their name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and his angels. And um, isn't that good to know that... Um, Oh, Jesus said, whoever is not ashamed of me in this wicked generation, I will confess his name before my Father and his angels, but whoever is ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of him before my Father and his angels. Can you find an example of that in the Bible? In the book of Job, do you see Job 
when the devil comes to accuse Job, doesn't the Lord confess the name of Job before the sons of God that are gathered? And so God is literally bragging about our names in heaven when we say we want to be faithful. He's looking for people that uh, serve him. And one more, Zephaniah 2 verse 3. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. It may be that you'll be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. He's telling us to seek him right now. Is there a day of wrath the Bible talks about? There's going to be a day of punishment. That's all coming. Now, um, I got a question came in from one of our viewers online live. It says, what about the verse in Matthew 24, 41, Two women are grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left. What does that mean? Now you also find this in Luke chapter 17 or Luke 21. It says two men are working in the field, two men sleeping in the bed, two women grinding at the mill. Uh, Luke adds one additional one about two men sleeping in a bed. What is Jesus saying? Is he saying, well, this is the secret rapture. You get two people outwardly doing the same thing and poof, one is taken away to heaven, the other is left behind. Are there books called Left Behind? They call it the Left Behind series. What's going to happen to those who are left behind in the secret rapture? Do you know when you read those passages in um, Matthew and in Luke, when they ask Jesus, he said, uh, where are they taken? He said, wherever the carcass is, that's where the vultures are gathered together. And he talks about back in the days of Noah, that they were eating and drinking, buying, marrying, building until the flood came and took them away. The flood came and took them away. Who's taken away? The saved or the lost? The lost. Let me explain this to you in the mind of the Jews. And this is very vivid in our minds having just come from that country. When the children of Israel were behaving, God let them stay in the promised land. When they dis, uh, misbehaved, then the Babylonians or the Romans came and carried them away. Or the Assyrians came and they were taken away in judgment. Uh, and so when it's talking about the ones taken away, it's not necessarily talking about a good thing. It's talking about that, that, that's a bad thing. The ones who are left behind, are they're preserved. The others are taken away. Um, talks about the... Uh, Wheat is gathered in the barn. The weeds are gathered and, and uh, burned in bundles. So what about one, two women, two men working in a field, two men sleeping in a bed? It's just describing two, three, or two categories, and it uses three examples. What is a woman a symbol of? How many kinds of churches are there in the world today? Two. There's only two roads, saved and lost. How many women are found in Revelation? Two, Revelation 12, good church, she's saved. Revelation 17, harlot, she's lost. So you get two women. What are they doing? They're grinding. What do you grind? Grain, make bread. What's the bread? Word of God. Two women, two churches, outwardly claiming that they've got the word of God. One is true, one is false. That's all it's saying. <clears throat> two men working in a field. What does Jesus say the field is? It's the world. They're out doing harvest. Jesus said, the harvest is great, the laborers are few. You've got two kinds of harvests that are happening. You've got the true and the false. What does sleep represent in the Bible? Our friend Lazarus is asleep. What did Jesus mean? He's dead. How many kinds of people are dead right now? Two. <laughs> Saved and the lost. How many resurrections? Two. You got the dead in Christ, and you got the resurrection of damnation, Jesus said. And so Christ is just talking about these two categories. He's not talking about people suddenly disappearing from cars and airplanes and, and a secret rapture. And so that's people often refer to that. Another question came in. Uh, when will the feet of Jesus stand on the Mount of Olives? Okay, that's a good question. That's in Zechariah chapter 14. And it says, His feet stand on the Mount of Olives on that day, and the Mount of Olives cleaves, and it forms a great valley and it is a very great valley because the new Jerusalem comes down at the end of the 1,000 years and sits in this valley that the Lord has prepared. Why does he do that? What was the last place that Jesus' feet touched when he ascended to heaven? The Bible says Mount of Olives, one place it says Bethany, but we were just there. Bethany's on the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives is a big, long mountain. And Bethany's about oh, 
two miles over on the mount. And Jesus from Bethany ascended to heaven, probably not too far from Martha and Lazarus' house that was there. And um, where did Jesus foretell his second coming? From the Mount of Olives. Where did he weep over Jerusalem? From the Mount of Olives. It was a very special place. So where is he coming back? Where was the best view of the temple? The Mount of Olives. It's where you look at it in its glory. Jesus' feet are touching the same place he left. Doesn't the Bible say when he ascended to heaven, two angels saw the apostles. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here staring into the heavens? This same Jesus that you saw go into heaven will come in the same way you saw him leave. He not only left, he was real. He's coming real. Left in the clouds, coming in the clouds. Left, he was visible. visible. He'll be visible when he comes. And when he left, it was the Mount of Olives. He's coming to the Mount of Olives. And so this is though at the end of the 1,000 years, his feet touch it, forms a great valley. How big is the New Jerusalem? 12,000 furlongs, but we don't use furlongs today. That's 375 miles on each side or about 1,500 miles around. Do you know what that means? All the land that God promised Abraham from the Euphrates down through the Sinai Peninsula will all be encompassed in that territory. In other words, God is literally going to wall in the promised land because God said Abraham looked for a city that had foundations. I thought he was waiting for the promised land. What do you mean a city? There was no Jerusalem back in Abraham's day. Abraham was looking forward to the new Jerusalem that would encompass the land that God had promised to his people. All right, and we've got another question I'll take in just a minute, but I want to get to something that's important and heavy. Daniel and the second coming. Now, I already read Daniel chapter 12. Does the book of Daniel talk about the second coming? Let's look at a few verses here. Daniel 2 verse 34 and 35 says, You watched while the stone was cut without hands that struck the image on the feet. This is that large idol in Daniel chapter 2. Of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff of the summer threshing floor and the wind carried them away so no trace of them was found and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, what is the stone? It's the kingdom of Jesus. You know something interesting? When you look at the metals in this image in Daniel 2, what's the top first metal? Gold, then? Is it gold, silver, then? Bronze, then? Iron, then? Iron and clay. And the last thing is stone that destroys it. So you got all these different minerals. What's more valuable, gold or silver? Gold. Which is harder? Silver. Harder than gold. What's more valuable, silver or bronze? Silver. Right? We all together? But what's harder, silver or bronze? Bronze is. What's more valuable, bronze or iron? Bronze. What's harder? Iron. You noticing something here? The kingdoms have less value, but they're harder. Do you know that each one of those kingdoms we've listed, the one after lasts longer? They're, each kingdom, the Roman kingdom, lasted longer than the Greek, which lasted longer than the Persians, which lasted longer than the Babylonians. What's the last kingdom? Stone. And, the, and which lasts the longest? All of these uh, metals were used to make idols in the Bible. They had gold idols and silver idols and bronze idols. Do you remember when the king Belshazzar made a feast and he's toasting the gods of iron and gold and so forth? But what were the children of Israel told to make their altar out of? Stone. Stone cut without a man's hands. They were not to lift up a tool on it because if they did, it would be polluted. He didn't want them carving things and worshiping statues. He just plain old rock, make your altar. It's a worshipful living God. So it's the stone that crushes all these things, all the, the idols of the world, the false religion. What did David use to bring down Goliath? A stone. What did God do to write the Ten Commandments? And that was the first set God cut without man's hands. It was cut with his hands. Isn't that interesting? Jesus said, he that hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man building his house on stone. The words of God. What brings down the idol? The Word of God brings down all the false religions. 
So ultimately the stone grows into a great mountain and fills the whole earth. This is talking about the kingdom of God is finally going to fill the whole world. Um, someone's going to read for me Matthew 24, 15. You'll have that? Do we got the mic working now? Say something. It is working. Okay. Before you read that, I'm going to read Daniel 2, 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left to another. It's not going to ever be replaced. It'll break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it will stand forever. So do you find the principle of God's eternal kingdom and second coming in the Old Testament prophecies? Still with me? All right. What more do we learn from Daniel? Go ahead, read Matthew 24, 15 and 16. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Here's your country living verse. When you see the abomination of desolation, flee. First of all, how do you know Daniel's a prophet? <laughs> because Jesus says so. <laughs> that settles it, doesn't it? Jesus says it's written by Daniel the prophet. Here Jesus is telling us, if you want to know it, I'm not going to tell you. Read the Bible. Jesus is saying, you read it for yourself. The problem is, Jesus mentions the abom uh, Daniel mentions the abomination of desolation several times. And there's a little confusion about what is he talking about? Let me give you some examples. Look in Daniel 9, 27. By the way, uh, when Jesus quotes the same verse in Luke 21, he said, when you see Jerusalem encompassed with armies, let those that be in Judea flee into the mountains. So the first thing about the abomination of desolation is talking about when God's people were literally surrounded in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the temple and uh, they were carried away captive. It, the place of God was desolated. So this is the first part. But there, you see Jesus in Matthew 24, he's answering two questions or even three questions. What are signs of your coming? When will these things be the destruction of the temple? He said there won't be one stone left on another and your return. So it's signs, he's talking about destruction of the temple, and what will be your return. Well, the children, uh, the uh, Christians that were in Jerusalem when the Romans came were given a brief window to escape. They fled into the mountains. They quite literally did that. And Jesus said, this generation will not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Jesus made this prediction about this temple's destruction. That's the first part of the abomination of desolation. He made it in 30 A.D., what is a Bible generation? 40 years. How do you know that? When the children of Israel were unfaithful in the days of Moses, he made that generation wander until they all died off. How long did they wander? 40 years. Moses' life is divided into three generations. He spent one generation in Egypt, one generation in the wilderness, 40 years there, and 40 years leading the people from Egypt to the promised land. David reigned for a generation, Saul reigned for a generation, Solomon reigned for a generation. They all reigned 40 years. So that prophecy happened perfectly, but it's a dual prophecy. Not only is he talking about the abomination of desolation that destroyed the temple, he said there'll be another power. This one is not pagan Rome. It will be papal Rome. It's not just the iron. It's the iron mixed with the clay. You still with me? Down on the feet, clay is like the religion mixed with the, the iron government. And um, there's a second abomination of desolation that's going to perse persecute God's people. So let me read a few verses on that. If you look in Daniel 9, 27. <clears throat> then he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will cause a sacrifice and the offering to cease. Now, who is that talking about? That's talking about the Messiah. Do you know that a lot of evangelicals think that it's the Antichrist? Now, I can understand that Christians may disagree on a few verses, but wouldn't you agree it's a serious misunderstanding if one Christian says that's the devil and the other one says that's the Lord? I mean, how wrong can someone be? So we've got to know, who is this talking about? And I remember doing a Bible study with some Baptists years ago, and uh, they, they were reading this, and the husband was like a lay pastor, and he said, yeah, the Antichrist is going to make a covenant. 
And I said, where in the Bible do you find the Antichrist making a covenant? Well, I says, right here. I said, what is that covenant that the Antichrist makes? I said, there's nothing in the Bible about that. And then I gave the study that said, it's the Messiah who makes a covenant with people. And for one week, from the beginning of his ministry, his being anointed in 27, three and a half years later, exactly half of a week, he is cut off for the sins of the people. He makes the sacrifice cease. The temple curtain is ripped. And then for another three and a half years, he preaches only through the apostles to Jews. And even the apostles say he testified through those that heard him. So in person and through the apostles, just to the Jewish nation, then they stoned Stephen three and a half years later. And it says a great persecution arose. The gospel went everywhere. I said, this is, this is the 490 year prophecy. It fits perfectly. And his wife went, that's the first time that's ever made sense. And he got very upset with me. Because he still insisted, no, this is the Antichrist. Now, why do people get confused on that? I hope you don't mind me taking this a little deeper. Go to Daniel 9. This is so important because I know people are watching. Most of you, I think, understand this. Go to Daniel chapter 9 and go to verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for the holy city. He says several things to happen in those 70 weeks. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity through the sacrifice of Christ to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy. After 70 weeks, this particular vision would be sealed and complete. And to anoint the most holy. All these things would happen. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince. Capital P. Messiah the Prince. Seven weeks, three score, two weeks. The street will be built again in the wall in troublous times. That's Ezra and Nehemiah. You read about it. And after 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. I mean, 62 weeks after the first seven weeks of them building those streets in the wall, Jesus was cut off, but not for himself. Now, this is where people get mixed up. And the people of the prince who is to come, small p, did you notice that? It's not the Messiah. Will destroy the city. It's talking about the Roman power, Roman king that would destroy the city and the sanctuary. This is the abomination of desolation, the first one when the temple would be destroyed. And the end of it shall be with a flood, means a flood of people. Like it says in Ezekiel, Gog and Magog, like a flood, they cover the earth. Till the end of the war, desolations are determined. So here you've got abomination, desolations are determined. Now it's returning to the main subject is all about the Messiah. He will confirm a covenant with many for one week. In the middle of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And then it says, and on the wing of abominations, shall be one who makes desolate. It's not talking about the Messiah. It's talking about this other prince who came. Even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So here you've got abomination of desolation. Can you understand why Jesus said, let him who reads understand? Now if Jesus said, I hope you understand, some have wondered if this was a parenthetical note that a scribe put in or if Christ is actually saying it. How many of you have a red letter edition in your Bible? When you read in Matthew chapter 24, verse um, uh, 15, it says, whoever reads, let him understand. Is that red or black? Red. It's black in my Bible. Some of you have it red in your Bibles? It's because the scribes don't agree. Is that Jesus saying, whoever reads, let him understand? Or is that the scribe or, or um, Matthew saying, whoever reads, let him understand? All I know is they're saying this is a deep subject and you pray that God will help you understand. Another example. Go to Daniel 11:31. And the forces shall be mustered by him. Now Daniel 11. What is that talking about? What happens in Daniel 12? Michael stands up. Daniel 11, you're talking about sometime between the Roman power and the end of the world. And it says, and forces will be mustered by him and they will defile the sanctuary, fortress and they will take away the daily sacrifice and the place there, the abomination of desolation. Now you've got that again. I was at Daniel 11, 31. And if you look in Daniel 12, verse 11 and 12, and this is a deep prophecy. There are more time prophecies in Daniel 12 than any other place. You've got three time prophecies. And um, we as a church typically believe in the historical application of this. We use the historical method. Some have argued that some prophecies have a dual fulfillment, as in Matthew 24, and they said there may be also a dual application. And it says here, and from the time the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation set up, 
there'll be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. And this is just by the last verses in the book of Daniel. He's talking about an abomination that makes desolate. So you've really got three examples of the abomination of desolation in my understanding. One is when the Roman power surrounded Jerusalem, they hedged them in, they besieged the city, they finally destroyed the city, they destroyed the temple, they desolated it. Now it does talk about when Nebuchadnezzar desolated it when he destroyed it back in the Old Testament, but I'm talking about from the time of Daniel on. Um, then you have a spiritual power during the Dark Ages that desolated the truth. The truth of the gospel was destroyed in the spiritual sanctuary. They tried to take away the daily sacrifice that were saved by grace, that you don't need to work your way to heaven. But then will there be a final time when God's people are surrounded by a Roman power with a law where we can't worship according to the Bible and we may need to flee into the wilderness again, literally, before the second coming? God's people are going to be in desolate places. All right, I got to keep going here. Another email question came in. Will there be a seven-year tribulation before Jesus comes? How many of you know that verse that talks about the seven-year tribulation? Can you please give it to me? How many of you have heard of a seven-year tribulation? You've heard of it. You've heard people talk about it. Where is the verse? There's no verse in the Bible that says there's a seven-year tribulation. Now, they, they do say, well, you know, the seven days that Noah was on the ark, that represents the seven years of tribulation. Um, and there's different, you know, when probation was closed. and It's not really taught in the Bible. All right, long-term prospects. Titus 2, verse 12 and 13. Teaching that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, because we believe in the second coming, we should live soberly righteously and godly in the present age does the Lord just kind of cover our past sins or does he want us to live different now if you want to be ready for the second coming how should we live soberly righteously and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior should you as a Christian talk about the second coming why are we called Seventh-day Adventists well, first of all we believe in keeping all Ten Commandments uh, do you know that uh, the, uh, the Sabbath really talks about the beginning and the end? It talks about the creation, and it talks about a millennial Sabbath at the end, if you will. And uh, Adventist means we are a people who are looking forward to the imminent return of the Lord, and we want people to get ready. When you talk to other people about the second coming, have you ever noticed it might make some folks nervous? That's a healthy nervousness. Because it means to think, well, you know, that might, that might shake my world. Yes. And you want to be ready for that day, right? Do you want people coming to you at the second coming and saying, you knew this was going to happen and you didn't tell me? You knew this was going to happen to the world, you didn't want to upset me? <laughs> people ought to know that the day of the Lord is coming, that this world is not going to last like this forever, as it was in the days of Sodom. So will it be when the Son of Man comes. Is it that way today? As it was in the days of Lot, eating, drinking, marrying. That's what's happening in the world today. People need to know. All right, another one. 2 Peter 3.11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, the world's going to be burned up, what manner of persons ought we be in all holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening? How do you hasten the second coming? The Bible says when the gospel goes into all the world, then the end will come. Can we participate in the gospel going into all the world? Hastening the second coming, in which the heavens being dissolved will be on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. So we need to have that big picture. Paul, before he died, and they call it Paul's swan song. 2 Timothy 4, 6. I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. Now, does he say when I die or on the day of the Lord? Not to me only, but to all those that love his appearing. So when you think of the day of the Lord, does it scare you? Or do you long for it? 
It's like a preacher said once, I get sick and tired of being sick and tired. I mean, you look around, there's a lot of pain and suffering in the world, a lot of sin, heartache. And when the Lord comes, no more pain, no more sorrow, all tears wiped away. Don't you long for that? If you're ready. Now, there's some reasons that we don't want them to come too soon. One, if you're not ready. Two, you have loved ones that aren't ready. And so sometimes you feel maybe a little mixed up, and that's normal. All right, someone's going to read for me about how the Lord comes. Matthew 25, 31. You, you go ahead and read that, Manjeet. When the Son of Man come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All right, the Bible says Jesus left in the clouds and He's coming in the clouds. Does that mean the Lord does not travel without H2O vapor? What is the clouds? I should say, what are the clouds? We believe they're angels. Let me just give you a few more verses. Psalm 104, verse 3. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks on the wings of the wind, who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. You notice it says, when the Son of Man comes with all the holy angels. How many angels are there? They got to be billions. I mean, if everyone has a guardian angel and there's eight billion people, um, these are the ministering spirits of God that help him not just minister on earth, but throughout the cosmos. And so there's a lot of angels. You can read in Revelation 1, 7, Behold, He's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him. Matthew 24, 30, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And I'll read you one more, maybe more than one more. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, And to give you who are troubled rest, with us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey. So we need to know the Lord. We need to obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, the living and the dead. So when do the dead rise? As soon as you die? No. I read four times in John chapter 6. It says, but should raise it up the last day. That's John 6, 39, John 6, 40. I will raise him up the last day. John 6, 44. I will raise him up the last day. John 6, 54. I will raise him up the last day. That's why in, when uh, Jesus raised Lazarus, Martha said, I know you'll rise him again in the resurrection at the last day. So she wasn't expecting Jesus to do something sooner. This for me is the best verse. I can see I'm running out of time. If you want to read a great verse that tells when it's going to happen, read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, we're all connected to Adam, so we grow old and die, but in Christ we will all be made alive. He is the second Adam. But each one in his own order. Here is the order how this happens. Christ the firstfruits, Jesus is already raised. Afterward, those who are Christ's at his coming. So when do they rise? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. It's at the coming of the Lord. And how many of you know somebody that thinks as soon as they die, they go to heaven? And they all say, oh yeah, so-and-so died and they're up in heaven now talking to Jesus. And, and it sounds really colorful, but it's not biblical. They are, the living know they'll die, but the dead know not anything. They are sleeping a dreamless sleep until the resurrection. Well, I want to remind everybody that we are going to be studying a new lesson next week on the book of Acts, and we're going to go all through, through all 28 chapters of Acts during that quarter. I'm really excited. That should be a great time for the church to kind of get a revival and refocus on their purpose. And for anyone watching, we have a free offer from Amazing Facts, if you like this book, called The Ultimate Deliverance. It's all about the second coming, what we've talked about today, and a lot more verses. If you'd like a free offer, uh, read this and then share it with the friends. It's offer number 105. Write that down when you call. 866-788-3966. 866-STUDY-MORE. God bless you, friends. Lord willing, we will study His Word together again next week.